I hope you're having a great morning. Um, this is Brittany coming from Burnt River Ranch. I'm just giving you guys an update video about what's been going on around here lately. So we actually just got a dairy cow. Um, I just made a video, a very short little video, kind of introducing you guys to her. Her name is Penelope. She is a Jersey with a little bit of brown Swiss in her, but mostly Jersey. And we've been milking her every day now for about a week. And I really like her. She's super cool and I'm enjoying getting to do that and um, learning how to make our own dairy products. So far I've made butter and sour cream and uh, what else did I make? Oh, we made farmer's cheese and then obviously just regular milk and cream. So that's been, that's been a cool new adventure that I wasn't really planning on doing quite yet, but the opportunity arose and I didn't want to miss out. In our area, there's not a lot of uh, milk cows available, and when there is, they go fast. So we decided to jump on it and go for it and and start this new journey, this new adventure with her. And it's been it's been really fun so far. Has been a lot of work. We are milking by hand, and every day I get a little bit better at it, a little bit stronger. Every day is kind of figuring out a new technique method. Um, learning how to properly pinch off the milk in the teats and bring it down and just, you know, getting my body used to that movement. It is a lot of work and takes a lot of strength. And I'll show you guys in another clip, but she has one back quarter, her teat on her back quarter. It's milkable, but it is definitely um, harder to milk out and takes a lot more strength to get that one going. So that one is a little bit frustrating, and I actually wouldn't doubt that might be the reason why they decided to rehome her. She's a great cow, otherwise we don't even have to put her in a stanchion or a head gate or anything to milk her. We just tie her up. She's halter broke. She leads really well, and yeah, we just tie her up to milk, and she stands there really good. Um, she does get a little bit distracted by humans uh, wandering around, because she just loves humans so much. She kind of follows you around the fence and... She's always calling to you and stuff. So, yeah, so that's been fun. Um, I'm really disappointed that she didn't come with a calf. I really, really wanted to do calf sharing just, just in case something happened where we couldn't milk that day or, you know, like maybe we wanted to go away for a weekend. Our plan was that we would be able to just leave the calf with her on those types of situations or in those types of situations. But because she didn't come with a calf, we can't do that. So we are tied down to the farm milking her every single day, whether we want to or not. Um, so actually today, I'm going to a family member's house of mine, and I'm going to pick up a heifer calf from her, and we're going to attempt to graft it on to her. I, uh, I don't know how that's going to go. I know that things can go south quickly, and I don't know if Penelope's actually ever had the opportunity to raise a calf of her own, or if they just took it away from her every time and milked her out by hand and then bottle fed the baby. I'm not sure. So we're going to try it out and see how it goes. I mean, it's a risk, but it could pay off really well in the fact that we could calf share. Or it could be um, another extra thing that we have to do every day to bottle feed this calf. I mean, we don't have to buy milk replacer because we have a dairy cow. So we can just feed the calf her milk. Um, but just an extra thing for us to do so hopefully that works out I mean you can sit here and, and worry about all the what ifs and all the things that could go wrong or you could just do it and maybe it'll go right I don't know we'll see we'll see what happens but yeah that's been our new adventure is having a dairy cow now I'm going to talk a little bit about the pigs because I have some things that I want to uh, share with you guys and discuss because I need to get it off my chest it's been it's been bugging me um 
for the last couple years, we've been uh, breeding pigs and farrowing them out. We have sows and a boar, and we actually just expanded this year and or this past fall, we decided to keep back um, a bunch more gilts. So our plan was to have a boar and eight sows. So that's a lot of sows to furrow out considering they all have about an average of 10 piglets. And it also means that we are now having to furrow out uh, more than one at a time. Whereas before, when we first started, we were just able to furrow out one sow at a time, wait till she weaned her babies and then have it planned that the next sow would furrow out right after. So again, not super set up to do that, but we've been making it work. We have three different stalls that we can put sows in so we can at least feral three out at a time. So we've been making that work. Um, however, we've had some setbacks for sure. So last year we AI'd one of our gilts, our Hereford gilts. We had AI'd her to a Berkshire and that worked out fairly well. Aside from the fact that somehow, I don't know if it was from something on the farm here or if it was maybe even from the semen itself, but she acquired some type of virus. We're not 100% sure what it was, if it was parvovirus or something along those lines, but anyways, that type of virus ends up making it so that the sows, they can still get pregnant. They don't really show symptoms of being ill. Um, however, when they go to have their babies, a lot of them are born dead or they die shortly after. They're just really poor doers. Um, so she had a really small litter. She ended up having, I think, four, four that survived in that litter out of the ten that she actually gave birth to. So that was really um, not great, but we were happy with the babies that we did have. They were really nice quality, good growing babies, the ones that did survive. So at least we had that. Um, but that virus unfortunately spread to the rest of our herd and so we had the same type of problems with the rest of our sows and ended up with really small litters for the rest of that year. So that was really unfortunate, that really set us back. Um, so yeah, so anyways, we now vaccinate for all of those things and we were hoping that we got that virus under control, which I think we did. But this year, um, we just started farrowing out sows now. Um, our first sow farrowed on February 23rd. That was Salty. She's one of our sows that we've had for a few years now, and she's always been characteristically known as one of our best sows. She's a little bit grumpy and ornery, so we have to watch out for that because she can be, well, she can be a little bit dangerous if you aren't careful. Um, but she does have nice big litters. She has no trouble farrowing and she is just a really good mama. Has lots of milk. We've grafted piglets onto her in the past before from other sows and she's just been a really good pig that way. However, um, it's like just when you're starting to get in the groove and, and let your guard down a little bit, that's, I feel like when problems start arising. So we, um, farrowed her out and she just really struggled a lot this year. She... Um, she was really agitated, act like she was in a lot of pain while she was farrowing. She was chewing on stuff, being super destructive. She was just really aggressive. So anyways, once she started finally going into labor and, and laid down and started farrowing, she usually just lays down, has babies, and she just kind of relaxes. And that is what it is. But this year, she was super clumsy and she just kept getting up over and over again. And usually I like to stay with my sows while they farrow if I can, just to make sure that I can prevent some problems from happening, like babies being stuck in the sack, or, you know, I can move them out of the way of mama if she does decide to get up. But but this time, um, yeah, Salty was just really, really agitated and stressed out. So I decided, you know what, I'm just going to leave her alone. I'm going to leave her alone for an hour and check on her later. So I did that. And when I went to go check on her after she had finished um there was two two dead babies in the farrowing stall and also she had stepped on another one and it was like in the process of dying so so yeah that wasn't great um so that also kind of signaled to me that regardless of if i was there or not she was still doing the same thing and having the same struggles so at that point, like, what do you do? So I just left her for the night. I went back to go check on her in the morning and she had crushed 
and killed so many more babies. It was just, uh, walking into that and looking at that is just horrendous. Like, you just look at that and you realize, holy man, that is a lot of money. It's just gone. Like, each one of those piglets would have brought in a little bit of money for our farm. And now those, that's just gone. It's just no more. So, yeah, she ended up killing, like, over half of her litter. And she's, like I said, never, ever had that problem before. So that was extremely disheartening to have that happen. And... If you've been following us for a while, you know that we try to do things like fairly naturally, fairly holistically, I guess. Um, we don't like to put ourselves in farrowing crates just because, you know, like, I don't really know if I believe in that. I like to give ourselves the opportunity to to build a nest and, and get comfortable and move around a little bit if they need to. But this is one of those scenarios that I would almost consider putting her in one. Um... I know it's terrible to be in pain and not be able to, like, move around, turn around and stuff, but at the same time, like, if you're not a good enough mother to realize that you just stepped on and squished and crushed your babies, like, that is also awful. So I don't know what the answer is there, like, I know there's lots of people that are super against farrowing crates and I get it, like, I'm of the same opinion, really, but for those that use them... I kind of get it. I kind of get it now with those bigger, older sows that are just not comfortable and not being careful and and being dangerous to the human too. I mean, the whole time I was around her, when I went to go check on her babies in the morning, she was really, really dangerous. She was trying to get me. I didn't even have the door open and she was like, she straight up, if she had the opportunity, she would have definitely put me on my butt and killed me for sure if she had the opportunity. And I didn't even have the door open yet. So I wasn't even physically in the pen with her at the time. So, yeah. I don't know. I know how people feel about farrowing crates. But at the same time, I, I kind of get it. There are some situations where it, maybe it's a better option for both the sow, for her babies, and the farmer. So I don't want to say that I'm, like, pro-farrowing crate or that we're going to, like, switch our whole farm over to that or anything. But I'm just saying, like... The people that do it, I kind of get it. Anyways, um, another thing that's been a setback for us with the pigs is around Christmas time, we had set up our gilts that we were going to AI them, so artificially inseminate them. We had ordered semen, and we were planning to AI them to a Berkshire and get them bred that way because the boar that we currently had at the time was their father, and I didn't want to breed them to a relative. Um, and also he was way too big to breed them anyway. He was like seven, 800 pound boar. He was way too big to breed gilts. So our plan was we were going to AI them. Christmas time came around and that was when they were kind of due to go into heat. We had some serious struggles with that. And unfortunately, none of them took. Really, really disappointing. Um, I think it might've been a combination of the fact that it was minus 50 outside and the semen probably got too cold despite my best efforts to keep it warm. And I tried to AI them as quick as possible. Also, because it was so darn cold outside at the time, um, it made it really difficult to tell if they were for sure at that right point in their heat cycle. You could tell they had some signs of being in heat, but it was very hard to tell if they were just on their exact right day. Because they do show signs of being in heat a few days before they're in heat, before they're actually in standing heat. And they need to be in standing heat in order for the AI to work. So, yeah, I don't know if that might have been it, that maybe I eyed, that, eyed them just a little bit too early. And yeah. So anyways, that didn't take. And then uh, we ended up selling our boar because of him being related to more of our herd than not so we have a new boar we had went down we drove all the way down to almost calgary to go get him he's a hereford and our intention was that he would be old enough to breed our gilts in the fall or late winter well we've had our gilts in with him now that the ai didn't take for a good three months quite a few cycles now and he is just obviously not getting the job done he's a little bit smaller than them but in my opinion he's not that much smaller than them that he shouldn't be getting the job done 
he just seems like he's lacking a little bit of drive like he doesn't go up to them and like and really want to be motivated to breed them so as soon as they start kind of moving away from him he's like no no i'm not gonna even try so yeah so again now we're having boar problems we're not getting gilts bred our gilts are starting to get a little bit on the fat side because they're not bred and I'm a little bit concerned that uh, they're going to have troubles with fertility um, and troubles giving birth if they do get bred. So now we're going to have to reevaluate what the heck we want to do there. I don't know what the right answer is. Do we risk it with the AI? The reason why I don't want to do that unless I have to is because shipping costs for AI is very expensive. The actual semen itself is not that bad. It's, I think, 20 bucks a dose for the Berkshire semen it's fresh cooled semen so it has to be shipped overnight and it has to be stored at 16 degrees celsius it's good for up to seven days which is great if you have all your gilts kind of in a close enough cycle that you can order it all at the same time and get them all done during that seven day period but if they're not and you have to order it two separate times well it starts to add up um shipping is about 200 dollars for us to get a box full of semen that will do three gilts and also um yeah so it adds up and at that point you're, you start wondering like is it worth it to do ai or is it worth it to just get a different boar the reason i haven't done that yet is because i've been trying to hold out and see if our boar can get it figured out and every cycle that he doesn't get it figured out it just makes me more and more frustrated Another reason is I don't really want to introduce diseases onto our farm. Um, if we got a new boar, we'd have to quarantine it. I don't really have a spot to do that. I'm a little bit leery about getting a mature boar just because um, they can be aggressive. I don't know what their background is. Um, I don't know their history. And like I said, it's a biosecurity risk. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to do there but my breeding plans for the year are so messed up at this point and i know that our boar that we currently have even if he could get the gilts done there's no way in heck he's gonna get our big mature sows bred so yeah i don't know what to do there but this year's just another one of those really really tough years that isn't working out with us with the pig situation with us oh another thing too uh last year so we had been using a butcher shop, a local butcher shop, to um, butcher our pigs for our customers with. It was a, a nice provincially inspected facility. They were super reliable, super professional. Um, just like not a lot of kinks working with them. Um, but they unfortunately closed down. And of course they closed right before um, butcher season for the pigs. They closed in the fall. So we were left in limbo trying to find another inspected facility to get our pigs to in pronto. Because um, they were due to go in in a, in a month at that time. So we were really limited on what options we could do. So we ended up going with one of the only options that was even available to us. And it was kind of a gong show. So very disorganized. Um, we had a lot of confused and unhappy customers which we've never ever had a problem with that before uh, people were struggling to get their meat back they were getting different answers they were getting told that it was not done curing after it should have been done curing weeks ago um yeah just it was a whole nightmare a whole run around um it took a lot of calling that place on our customer's end and our end and trying to get things organized and it was just it was just a mess just a mess and that is not what i want attached to our name for our customers so now another thing we have to worry about this year is trying to find another butcher shop to use we actually have our on-farm butcher license so we can butcher an animal for our customers on our farm however that's not as easy as it may sound. So just because we can do that doesn't mean it's the best option. Um, that's a lot more extra work for us. Anybody that's ever butchered a pig or anything knows that it takes a lot more work for us to do it. We now have to gut that animal, skin that animal, because we don't have a scalder. So anybody that wants to keep the skin on their pigs, it's just it wouldn't even be 
an option for us. Um, if you don't do it properly, you can really mess up your bacon. And so that's a worry. Um, another thing too is just now we have to worry about disposal. We have to get rid of all the guts and the heads and the skins and the hides and whatever. All that stuff has to go somewhere. And it is not legal for us to just go dump it in the back 40. That is not legal according to our license. And I don't want to do that anyways because that attracts so many predators that could harm the rest of our livestock. So, yeah. So we'd have to like invest in an incinerator or something like that. And it's just a whole big whack mess. Then we have all the work of trying to cut up these pigs to our customer's specs. And I'll be the first to admit, I am not a professional butcher. And I don't want our customers getting angry that things weren't done in accordance to what they're used to because I am not a perfect butcher, that is for sure. So yeah, we're gonna have to find a new place to get that done and it's gonna be a nightmare, I already know it. So yeah, this year has been, this year and last year has been a struggle and very frustrating and very overwhelming trying to figure out what the heck to do here, but yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to get that off my chest because I've been kind of, I don't know, maybe not being super honest or not sharing the full truth of what's been going on here. But it's uh, been weighing heavy on my heart because it's a lot of finances involved and, and stress and all that. So, yeah, I guess just keep us in your prayers. Hopefully we can uh, figure out some kind of solution here and uh, things will get better in the future, I hope. Yeah. Anyways, I hope you guys are taking care of yourselves and doing well and just wanted to share the trials and tribulations of real life farming, not just the romanticized version. Yeah, thank you again for watching. If you guys could please like and subscribe, that would really help our channel, help us reach more viewers like you and people that are interested in this type of content. I will catch you guys on the next video.